Uh, thanks for joining us. I think we'll wait uh, a minute or two here just to allow a few folks to join and then we will kick off. Thanks for joining us this morning. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we will get kicked off now. And, and thanks again for joining us. Um, welcome. And, and my name is Jay Ganatra, and I'm a partner at PayPal Ventures. And I'm really excited to host two of our portfolio company CEOs, Adrian Sanders and Kevin Gostrock of ChargeHound and uh, Arcos Labs, respectively for our discussion today on how automation is driving innovation in payments and fraud. Uh, as all of you guys know, this topic was super relevant pre-COVID as we were in the midst of a multi-year shift from offline to online commerce. But, you know, COVID has really accelerated this trend massively and done so in an incredibly compressed period of time. Uh, while this boost in traffic and orders has obviously been welcomed by many merchants uh, from a revenue perspective, it comes with increasing burdens for their payments, risk, and fraud teams. Uh, automation technology has obviously been a massive help to these organizations, and we'll be talking through some of what we've seen from the ChargeHound, Charge Arcos Labs, and PayPal perspectives uh, on this call today. Um, before I hand it over to Kevin and Adrian to introduce themselves, I wanted to let you know that there is a Q&A feature within this Zoom uh, webinar and I wanted to invite you to submit questions throughout this session uh, as they come up. We'll have time for them at the end, and I'll also try and rope in any questions during the panel conversation as well. Um, first, though, let me hand it over to Adrian to talk a bit about himself uh, and ChargeHound. Thank you so much, Jay. Uh, happy to be here, uh, and uh, I think it'll be fun to talk about some of these trends. Uh, a little bit about myself. I'm the CEO and co-founder of ChargeHound, uh, along with the CTO and co-founder, Dimitri Cherniak. Um, we uh, created ChargeHound about four years ago. Uh, and basically what ChargeHound does is it completely automates the chargeback representment process for merchants. So if you get chargebacks uh, and you have to represent them and defend them, we remove all the need for people to be involved in that process. So uh, particularly useful for merchants that get a lot of chargebacks or large scale merchants. Um, we started the company, uh, like I said, four years ago, because we sort of had that problem ourselves when we were merchants um, and uh, just realized that automation was going to be a critical way of dealing with it. Um, we became a strategic partner and a venture portfolio company for with PayPal. Uh, what was that last year? Yeah, right. March of 2019. Um, basically, as we've sort of serviced more and more merchants at scale, I think PayPal particularly was interested in that. Um, and, um, you know, we've sort of been able to engage in, and do deeper collaborations to help merchants um, sort of as they uh, grow their business online. Awesome. I'll hand it over to Kevin. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. And, and Kevin, it'd be great to hear the same from you. Sure. So we're, um, we're kind of tackling the problem a little bit of a different way. Uh, so my name is Kevin Gostchuk. I'm the CEO and founder of Arcos Labs. And really the objective of Arcos' technology when we work with merchants and companies is 
they're being attacked by fraudsters, of course. We're all under attack by fraudsters. If you have a successful business, uh, then you're going to have fraud coming after you. Our objective is to make it more expensive for the fraudsters to attack you than the return on investment they get back from doing so. And we do all of that mitigation as early in the, in the journey of the attacker as possible. So typically it's things like logins, so stopping credential stuff from an account takeover, or maybe it's account creation to stop them from actually being able to generate an account that they then use for fraudulent behavior. And the platform is designed around two pieces. We have a risk engine, which categorizes traffic. It uses biometric signals, device ID, network intelligence, things like that. And then if we think you're risky, what we actually do is we step you up into a challenge experience. And there's different kinds of challenges depending on the kind of threat we think you are. So if you're an automated threat, there's kind of one flavor. If you're a human threat, manually doing a fraud by hand, we have a different type of technology which saps efficiency. But all of the whole platform is designed to really kind of go after the economics. And this is a managed service. You know, merchants don't have to go and uh, manually curate any of this. So it's pretty much a set and forget kind of experience when you integrate the technology in. It's awesome. Uh, thanks for the intros, guys. Uh, as investors in, in both companies, we're obviously a bit biased, but uh, we've been really impressed by the impact and value that both companies have created for their customers and, and, and really, again, excited to talk about it today. Um, before we get into to, you know, the deeper conversation, I'll give a quick in, intro on myself and PayPal Ventures. Uh, I lead PayPal Ventures Global Investing Efforts. Uh, we have a $500 million fund focused on early and growth stage investments in the fintech, commerce enablement, risk and fraud, and payment sectors. Uh, we have roughly 30 active portfolio companies and, and are investing into about eight to 10 new companies a year. Uh, the goal of the fund is really to find interesting companies that are playing in adjacent spaces to PayPal and that are creating products that could help either PayPal's merchants or its consumers. And for both Arcos and Chargehound, we found that their solutions were solving critical pain points that our merchants were facing. Whether that be malicious traffic in Arcos's case or dealing with the burdens and pain and costs of chargebacks in Chargehound's case, these were consistent problems that our merchants were facing. And as a partner of our merchants, we wanted to help fund companies that could help alleviate those issues. Um, as the global leader in FinTech, we're uniquely positioned to evaluate and then help these companies grow through both advice, partnerships, business development opportunities, et cetera. And, and we're excited to put our support behind both of these guys. So um, with the intros out of the way, let's dive into some of the questions. And again, uh, if you guys have questions throughout this, uh, please submit it to the Q&A and, and we will uh, try and rope it in or, or, or get to it at the end. Um, so again, the, the topic of today's discussion is automation technology. Uh, that's a loaded phrase. And, and frankly, you know, for both of you guys, I'd be curious to see how both of you define that um, and think about it with regards to what your company is doing internally and then also on behalf of your merchants. Sure. I mean, I can talk a little bit about it from the charge on perspective and kind of how we got there. So when we entered, when, before we started charge on, right, like I said, we, we had a crowdfunding company and we actually had a chargeback problem. So we went into the market and we, we talked with all of the major vendors and everyone is like, yes, we have technology and automation and we're like, great. And so then once we start probing and sort of getting down to brass tacks and potentially implementing what we realize is none of that fit our definition of automation. So for us, we have a very clear defined sense of what it means, um, which is, hey, no people should in theory be involved in this process. It should be completely done by computers. So, um, you know, in the way that like uh, email is automated, like there is no people disseminating uh, email from one inbox to another. Uh, we think that chargeback representation should be the same way. Um, and that is a huge paradigm shift in thinking, if you think about, just to continue that analogy, the difference between sending a, a physical letter and sending an email, right? One of those has automation and one of those is almost entirely manual. So for us, it really is about what technology is supposed to do is, is rapidly increase the efficiency of a process um, in a way that completely changes the paradigm of how you think about it. So uh, for me and for Chargehound, that's a lot of how we drive a conversation is we're like, okay, 
you have 25 people working on this right now and you know you originally hired them to, to work on fraud prevention what if they never had to touch a dispute again um, that's the sort of that's how we think of automation as being potent and, and useful yeah Arcos obviously has a bit of a, a different flavor to automation so there's really kind of two answers i take to what does automation mean so when we look at uh, combating abuse and fraud for our merchants, uh, obviously that whole approach has to be done using rules, machine learning, um, you know, all these kind of things like that, because you can't manually curate every user that's coming in to make a transaction or to log in or to create an account or any of these kind of touch points. So there has to be a lot of uh, technology in play that's making the risk classifications um, and we, from an automation standpoint, uh, utilize a lot of these techniques to kind of, you know, qualify traffic as it's coming through the merchant flow. And to do automation in traffic curation, you need to have feedback loops that validate you're doing the right thing. So if you think something is a bad user, maybe it's an automated credential stuffing attack, you need to have a way to validate that you're saying it's bad, therefore you want to reject that request that's where our challenge technology comes into play. So if we make a decision that we think you're a bad user, we classify you as such using our automated um, you know, risk engine, the challenge actually reinforces that. So if we issue you a challenge and you don't interact with it in a way that we expect a good user to do so, we're able to train on that. So this takes away things like manual review and manual processes that companies have been doing uh, to, to qualify and certify traffic being bad because we can actually test against the challenge of the feedback loop. The other flavor of automation is, of course, what are the bad actors doing, right? So, um, you know, they have their own take on automation and, and techniques. So there's products like Century MBA, where criminals are using these tools to do automation against you uh, with the intent of doing things like credential stuffing. So they're getting access to, you know, all the usernames and passwords on the dark web or even on the public web nowadays, it's pretty easy to do so. And they're testing against you uh, using the same kind of techniques. So. If the bad guys are heavily automating their entire flow and doing a really good job of hiding their requests, there's no way you can put humans uh, in the mix to try and mitigate it. You need to fight back with equally uh, sophisticated automation techniques as well. Yeah, it's, uh, that's super interesting. And I know when we're looking at Arcos and learning about Arcos in the, um, you know, when we were looking at the investment, just thinking through the manual sweatshop approach that, you know, it's automation of a different different flavor and, and, and again, you know, the approach that you guys have around changing the economics and flipping the economics on their head for these, you know, fraudsters is something that, you know, I think we thought was really, uh, really unique. Um, Adrian, back to, back to you, I think, you know, thinking through the origin stories here and, you know, how you guys came up with Charge Hound, um, you know, I thought that was something that, that really resonated with me when we first chatted um, and thinking about, you know, how you guys originally came up with this idea. Can you actually talk through that, that story of what you guys were doing originally that led you into, into solving this pain point? Yeah, so we, we had a crowdfunding platform um, and uh, we had gone through this uh, startup accelerator called Y Combinator and um, out the gate, you know, we got a lot of press and a lot of interest in what we were doing and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it was all champagne and roses for like a month. And then, you know, the growth, you know, the trough of sorrow, the growth starts to flatten out and panic sets in. Um, but we, you know, we, what we really saw, I think that was interesting is that people were charging back like a dollar, right? And so we were built on top of Stripe at the time and, and Stripe will charge you, you know, $15 for, for a dispute. And so basically, you know, for every dollar chargeback we were, that we lost, we were losing $16. And as a, as a crowdfunding company, you're already only taking like six or 7% at tops. So every single chargeback was completely obliterating our margin. Um, and we didn't, you know, to be candid, I tell all of our merchants this, like I didn't know anything about chargebacks like five years ago, right? I had no idea what they were, right? Um, and so we were like getting these pings from Stripe. And I was like, what the heck is this? Like, why are we losing this money? And uh, Dimitri, this is like a, you know, Dimitri feels like, hey, these people are defrauding us. And he was really vehemently against that. And so, you know, we, we go into the Stripe dashboard or whatever, and they're telling us, you know, hey, here's what you can do to win these 
So then we fill all this stuff out, right? Which takes forever. And then it's like, we win like, you know, maybe we fight 20% of them and then we win like literally 0% of them. And I was like, I, as the CEO of the company should probably be working on other things. I just spent like two weeks of my time trying to figure this out. And it's ridiculous because I'm never going to spend that time on those dollar chargebacks or even the, honestly, the $20 chargebacks. Right. And so we kind of were like, okay, well, can we roll this into margin? And we were looking at, okay, will we take 5% of a dollar? The answer is no, like we will never be able to roll this into margin. Um, and so Dimitri and I basically, we worked with our, one of our senior engineers, Malcolm McDonald, and um, we looked at what the card networks were offering for guidance. And we said, hey, you know, is there a way to automate this, right? And put a little bit of logic behind it and really like get at the heart of what, it, what constitutes a win. And basically that was the first sort of V0 of ChargeHound. Um, and what was sort of powerful around that is that, yeah, you, you're never going to figure out how to successfully win disputes in a two week period if you're doing it manually. But if you're submitting a thousand of them with a computer, you learn very quickly, right? And now we submit like hundreds of thousands of disputes, right? So it's, um, you learn super fast when you're using technology, what the card networks expect, what the issuing banks expect. As things change uh, and guidance, it's easier to implement it. So, um, you know, it really was this, you know, classic startup dog fooding of like, hey, let's solve this crappy problem that's really annoying. And then we were like, hey, this is a much better business than crowdfunding since there's already a million other crowdfunding <laughs> out there. Um, and you can always tell that you're working on something that's better when investors that you haven't talked to in like two years now all of a sudden are like, hey, tell me more about like what you're working on now. You know, um, you know they all of a sudden respond to your emails and stuff like that. So um, definitely a very different um, business than what we started with, but um, the need was so clear. And like I said, we went back through the Y Combinator community and just the community of um, makers and creators, Dimitri and I knew um, in New York and in, in San Francisco and every single B2C company that we talked to had a chargeback problem and they hated dealing with it. So, and then I met yeah. you and it all, everything, uh, everything's been golden ever since. Good. Yeah, the, the, the quick side note on this is I, prior to joining PayPal, I used to lead E24 for Yelp, which is an online food ordering platform that eventually Grubhub acquired. And I used to manage this same process uh, and had a team of people doing this. And I just had wished that, you know, I knew about ChargeHound at the time because it would have saved us a lot of money and time and effort. Um, and it's just viscerally so painful, right? Like, yeah, I think it's, exactly. it's a psychological pain, so. Um, well, very cool. So. Kevin, uh, maybe flipping back to you, um, how do you, like, when you think about the evolution of fraud over the last, you know, 5, 10, 20 years, you know, how, how have you viewed it? How do you, like, what do you think it means for merchants, for different, you know, two-sided networks, things like that, financial institutions? It, it's a broad question, but, you know, how have you seen the evolution of, of, you know, fraudsters and, frankly, how smart they've gotten in different technologies, things like that? Yeah, I think, um, I don't know if my opinion can go beyond five years, given I haven't been in the industry uh, quite that long. Um, but we, you know, we work with a lot of the major enterprises, Fortune 100 kind of companies um, dealing with, you know, really advanced attacks. But it all comes down to kind of, you know, what's the monetary incentive? Like we have uh, merchants that have credit cards for their stores that they want to incentivize people to use. If you use the credit card, you get some points, some loyalty points to spend in the store. And um, you'd expect that the fraudster might go after the credit card to, uh, to be able to use that to then make fraud. But actually what they're going after is the kind of bonuses that these companies offer to incentivize you to sign up for a credit card. So maybe, for example, they give you a $100 gift voucher for their store if you get a successful application in. And what they're doing is actually going after the $100 gift card, uh, not the credit card itself. And fraud is not an individual. You know, there's not really one person that's making the attack uh, in the scheme of things, yes, you as a merchant see one attacker coming after you, but what they're doing is they're buying from a greater ecosystem of fraud that's all set up. So for example, to um, apply for a loan or apply for a credit card, you need KYC validator, you know, know your customer, kind of like social security number, phone address, that kind of information. 
you'll go and buy that data. If there's pre-packaged sets of information, you can go and purchase. And of course, someone else has gone and actually stolen that information from other people. So you've already kind of used something that's a value chain of multiple users. And then to optimize making money from, say, this bonus referral abuse scenario, you want to be able to do it at scale. You don't want to do it by hand. Or maybe you want to have other people do it by hand, but you want to scale that operation. So you can either um, go out and procure software that can help you automate through the application process, or you can hire humans and basically list the job as uh, data entry. And their job is to copy paste the data that you've purchased into the application process uh, to then get that gift card, which then ultimately goes back to the fraudster. So what appears to the merchant as one fraudster attacking them could actually be an army of people um, that have spent many, many hours building out these kind of attack regimes. So I think what we're seeing now is kind of the, um, the ecosystem that the fraudsters have backing them and supporting them is growing exponentially. Every time they're successful committing fraud, they're going back and reinvesting in the criminal ecosystem, which in turn obviously makes it grow. And Adrian was mentioning kind of these dollar um, chargeback claims. That's obviously a great example of something that we... Yeah. yeah, it's carding attack. So they're just checking to see if that's a credit card that's valid so they can then repackage it and sell it. So that's an example of part of the uh, value chain of the fraud ecosystem. They're just one piece. They're taking that $1 check and then they're going to a, a different company. You know, we've seen uh, a whole range of scenarios, companies that sell uh, $1,000 items where they're coming in with a pre-validated card that they've checked somewhere else. Crowdfunding platforms are great because you can do very low volume transactions to test. And then they're doing an $800 transaction. Or we've seen uh, telephony services or multi-factor uh, services where you can set up um, a premium number and they're actually buying um, phone numbers to call premium numbers. They make money back every time they call this premium number. There's all kinds of amazing things that they're doing. But uh, I think creativity by the criminals continues to grow. Uh, sophistication is growing alongside that. But I think the creativity is what really keeps them ahead of the game. It's like they think of really interesting ways to make money they're not necessarily the most advanced attack techniques, but they're just creative scenarios that we're not necessarily thinking about. And really, it just impresses me every time we hear about, you know, kind I'm of new complimenting attack. too much, Kevin. They're still bad guys. <laughs> I'm, I'm, just, uh, I'm just very impressed by them a lot of times. They are bad guys. You are true. <laughs> no, I, I, I do agree. This is this, um, you know, it's a perpetual, you know, cat and mouse game. And I think kind of going back to the automation theme, it's, you know, how do you, how do you automate your internal processes? And, you know, when you think about machine learning and all of its capabilities, the ability to continuously iterate on everything that you're seeing. I think Adrian brought up a good point that, you know, when you're only, you know, in his case, disputing 20 things a week or whatever it ends up being, or a hundred things a week, you learn this much. Whereas once you're doing it at scale, your ability to improve your processes and outcomes is just, you know, infinitely better. And I think the bad guys have the best way to do this because every time they get something where they get blocked or challenged or prevented, they now know what not to do. So if anyone's got the best advantage when it comes to uh, automation and all of this warfare, it's actually going to be the bad guys because they get the cleanest signal for feedback. It's like, I'm blocked. Okay, try again. Oh, I'm blocked. Try again. And eventually they'll slip through because you can't block everything. Otherwise, you don't have a business. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's a really fascinating problem where the bad guys have far more information than we do in most scenarios. And if they uh, take advantage of that, they can do a lot of harm. You know, yeah, on our side of stuff, I think the other thing that's been kind of interesting is, you know, we, you talked about kind of the, the transition to more transactions happening online and you just have companies with different levels of literacy and savviness going into that problem. So if you're a sort of native D2C company that just started selling stuff online from the get-go, the way you think about the scale of transactions is very different than you're a brick and mortar company that's traditionally done five to 10% online. And then, you know, you've got directions from above that you need to move to 20% online. Right. But then actually 40% of your volume ends up being online. Right. So whatever you thought, you know, your transaction volumes would look like and all of the operational complexity that that will drive is actually, you know, an order of magnitude higher, right? So there's, there's things like that where some of it, I think that we see is just, hey, we didn't realize that this is very different than brick and mortar, right? That this is very different than the old world of a handful of, you know, a couple of hundred people coming through our store every day versus, hey, anyone on the internet can 
potentially, you know, buy stuff here. So um, it's, it's, again, it's, it's a very different way of thinking. Awesome. Well, um, we have our first uh, poll question. And, or not poll question, sorry, uh, uh, Q&A question uh, from one of our participants. And um, Kevin, this is for you. Uh, how does Arcos manage fraud protection uh, while adhering to different country privacy laws? I think that's something that you know we spent a lot of time on when we were looking at um, looking at diligence on you because PayPal obviously cares a ton about that as well. Um, and are you? Do you have to vary? your product based on where the merchant is located? It's a good question. Um, so all the privacy laws are quite important. We also work with um, a number of companies that care very deeply about uh, child protection and things like that. So a lot of big video game merchants, for example. So our product is more intent based. So we're looking at user intent to figure out, do we think the intention is good or bad? We don't care so much about who you actually are as an individual, I don't care that you're John Smith. I just care if you're going to do bad things or good things, right? So we're not looking at things like usernames, emails. We're not looking at the credit card details. We're actually able to do our job entirely more based on the behavior. So we look at biometrics, how they interact. A bad actor, a criminal who's making multiple applications is obviously very different to an individual human, good user, who's making one application and then they're done, they go away. The criminals are doing things in ways, because they're incentivized by money, that's how they make ends meet, uh, that are very unusual. So they're not typical traffic trends. They also act kind of like power users, like users that just know everything about your page experience, exactly what to do. They're very familiar with the flow. So they'll act in a very different way. So we're able to basically make our classifications without the need of information that ultimately would be deemed uh, a big privacy risk. We do collect a uh, user IP address as part of our risk assessment, but that's actually the only form of PII we're collecting. Things like device fingerprints and such, we actually can't tie back to a individual. Um, but we do sign data processing agreements with every company we work with, which outlines that if you have a request from a customer in any region of the world, you can let us know and we can delete certain information about that user. Uh, if we can actually figure out it's even the same person. Uh, the initial goal is to make sure we can't even figure out who is who in the platform. It's all done, uh, of course, automatically with machines, so humans aren't curating and viewing that kind of data. Cool. Um, so, you know, I think we want to get some, some more audience uh, participation, and then also, um, you know, frankly, have you guys all, all learn from each other as well. And so we've got a poll that we're going to launch here, um, and wanted to ask all of you around uh, has, how has COVID impacted your business and has it changed the way you think about using technology for uh, your fraud and payment operations? Um, we'll, uh, we'll leave this poll up for about 30 seconds or so and then we can, um, I think the, the results should. So maybe um, while we're waiting for that to come in, um, you know, the benefit of being a fraud prevention or detection tool across kind of the ecosystem is you know, we can kind of look and see what's happening. What are the trends in traffic that have changed since things like COVID has occurred? I'm sure Adrian, you have an opinion on this as well. Uh, but across our network, we've seen about a 30% increase in fraud. And one of the primary drivers of that is because there's more people online, the return on investment for doing attacks against people online has actually risen. So you could potentially make up to two or three times more money per attack than you were able to do pre-COVID because the attack surface has risen uh, quite dramatically. Um, and that in turn obviously fuels uh, growth and investment in committing more fraud. Um, Adrian, I'd, be, I'd love to hear actually what's happening on your network if you're seeing similar things. Yeah, we have seen massive spikes in chargebacks. Um, so, you know, for some more impacted sectors like ticketing and events and travel, um, for some companies, it's been like a 2000% increase in chargebacks month over month. Um, like on the whole, you're seeing several hundred percent spike, uh, increase for things like travel ticketing and events. Um, and for retail, you know, almost 25%. So, so, so when travel, um, obviously that's, uh, it's probably less fraud happening in travel because there's, and, and tickets, I think is another example where ticketing transactions have gone way down. Those chargebacks, do you think, are more related to uh, legitimate users that obviously don't want to attend a certain conference or do travel, or what do you think it's tied back to? 
So obviously at percentages like that, it's going to be complicated, right? Uh, it's not necessarily one thing. And what I would say is that, you know, for sure, customers that booked an event and that event takes place in March or April, right? Of course, are, are charging it back. Some of that comes down to comms, right? Communication. How are those ticketing merchants and event merchants and hoteling merchants getting out ahead of it? But you can only get so far out ahead of that. And there's only so much you can really do, right? And, you know, in your customer service, you may say, hey, look, we're going to give you a refund, but we need to hold this money for X amount of time. That's still now, you know, you might still see a chargeback, right? Um, the thing about chargebacks is that it's, it's uh, designed to be gray. Everything in that space is very gray. So if I don't like the terms of service and I'm a cardholder, can I, can I try and charge it back and get my money back faster, right? Um, certainly issuing banks tend to, you know, be very pro customer, right? So, um, but yeah, also, you also have people who are looking at events that they bought in for October and maybe it will be open, but now they're just not really excited about being around 5,000 people in October. Right. And so even though they shouldn't be able to get a refund, they're using chargebacks as a way of sort of getting out. Um, but it really is like, it's all over. Again, it's, it's just the scale of it. You're going to have every possible, you know, sort of permutation of reasons for having a chargeback, including more fraud, for sure. Yeah, you know, it's, what's interesting about um, this webinar, and as, as you guys are talking about this, it reminded me is, um, you know, we've got Arcos that kind of sits at the front end with uh, all the traffic coming into the site. Um, Adrian sitting kind of at the back end post-transaction and the chargebacks associated, you know, some of what with fraud and some of with, you know, friendly fraud as well. Yeah. Um, and then there's kind of PayPal that's sitting in the middle with, you know, much of the transaction flow from checkout uh, into, into the card swipe. And I actually... I caught up with our risk and fraud team yesterday just to actually ask the same questions um, around what they were seeing. And, and similar to what both of you guys were saying, a huge increase in, in traffic, both, you know, frankly, both good and bad traffic for, you know, you've seen this big shift to online commerce too, but on the, on the fraudulent traffic, a, a huge shift, uh, PayPal's made um, a number of investments into that area and, and actually recently launched a you know, fraud prevention for PayPal commerce platform that will help, you know, mitigate um, any of the fraud that's, that's, you know, kind of coming through some of these single actors as well. And that's something that, you know, I think that there's a whole ecosystem here um, and fraud has to be kind of fought completely al along the way. Um, and so that's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a nice group here at least that, uh, We've been able to assemble. Um, yeah, so we just got the poll results back, and, and I think that hopefully you guys can all see this. But uh, it looks like you know over uh, maybe ninety or about ninety percent here, uh, or sorry, eighty percent here of folks are you know considering automation technology either accelerating um, or considering using it for the first time. Um, and, you know, I think that, that speaks to, you know, the problems that uh, it looks like a lot of folks are seeing. Um, and so, you know, something that uh, makes this very topical for, for everyone who's joined today. Um, I think with, um, with, with COVID, so a lot of, uh, and I know, Adrian, you're talking to this a little bit already, like businesses that are considering going online and things like that. COVID's kind of forced that. Businesses, retailers, even um, like pick up on the curb and stuff like that is now a cardinal present transaction. Yeah, right? Boppus. Boppus is like uh, buy online, pick up in store are getting destroyed by chargebacks and chargeback fraud because it's technically a card not present transaction, even though you're literally showing up to pick it up and you could have the card present, right? Um, and again, I think this is, you know, uh, Jay mentioned this at the beginning of the, of the call that, you know, hey, we've been talking about things moving, trending online and you have a lot of people being like, all right, every year it'll go up like 10 or 15% transactions online. And now you might've had 20% transactions online and now it's like 99%. Oh. And so how do you deal with things like your retail space? How do you make it effective? Okay, well, we'll do Boppus. Well, uh, you know, the card networks and the way that we think about transaction fees, the way we think about chargebacks, uh, all the rules were never designed to anticipate 
this much going on at that scale, right? And now it's just all at once, right? You literally can't buy anything in a store. All the transactions have to be card not present. So your, your chargeback fraud, your friendly fraud, like if you want to talk about, uh, you know, I ordered uh, this number one special at, you know, this Vietnamese restaurant, I got the number two special. How do I rectify that? Are the delivery uh, companies built to sort of handle literally millions of those as opposed to hundreds of thousands of them? And then it's like, from a chargeback perspective, uh, are the issue, how do the issuing banks look at that, right? And again, this is all stuff that you can only learn by doing. And the only way you can do this at scale is through automation, right? So this is like a huge problem if you're not automating it, you just can't tack in the wind fast enough. Right? So this might be what's driving uh, the audience's uh, adoption of new technology because of COVID, right? So there's so many more businesses that just haven't had to play ball with online fraud in the past. and yeah. There's a whole bunch of different flavors to it. Uh, obviously, when they ultimately are successful, you'll end up with things like chargebacks, but uh, hopefully uh, you can stop them well in advance of that, which is, of course, uh, our objective is to make sure Adrian doesn't have to do too much work. But uh, yeah. the reality there's and so I mean, much. It is, it is, no, I mean, and it is super fascinating, right? Like if, you're, if your customer service and your refunds are not set up in a way that handles scale, because maybe you've never had to deal with the scale before, you're going to get chargebacks, which are an in, a leading indicator that not that you have a fraud problem, or even that like you have a, you know, a delivery problem or whatever, but that your CS, your whole customer service wing needs to be completely rebuilt, right? Um, we, um, we just did a study on how uh, kids use the internet online. Obviously, this is super relevant given COVID, more and more kids are online playing games and things like that than at school and all this kind of stuff. They're very lucky. I think I would love to be on playing games instead of going to school when I was younger. But uh, I imagine this is also a drive in things like friendly fraud uh, because yes. you know, the kids using a device and uh, they're buying whatever they want to buy in the device. And the parents, you know, at work and there's, please, please stop bothering me. Here's my phone. Go play the <laughs> game. Um, I'm sure that's also something that you're probably seeing as well, Adrian. And it's a drive in, um, family fraud, right? Yes, uh, for sure. The access to the credit card at home, yeah. right? And um, and even stuff like, I mean, it, I think friendly fraud is, is sort of a mis, or it's not a misnomer, but there are two, basically two types. One is like your grandma bought you a birthday present and then she looks at her card statement and is like, you know, I don't know what that is. And, <laughs> you know, because she bought you a pair of Nikes, she didn't know she bought it from, you know, bobshoes.com or whatever. Um, so that's like, you know, quote unquote, true friendly fraud. Um, another form of friendly fraud is, hey, I'm the card holder and I'm just going to defraud the merchant, right? Which, you know, um, I wouldn't consider that super friendly, but it's, it's almost no. untraceable by traditional fraud networks because they are the card holder, right? right? Like, and so there's kind of no way right now to deal with that other than through representment. Um, and I, I mean, we can talk a little bit about that later, but uh, yeah, you're seeing a ton more of that, right? And I think that, again, the thing is, is like um, the impacts of just the scale of everything. So I'll, I'll give you a really interesting example that we've seen with our e-tailers, right? Like the e-commerce companies. Um, okay, let's say you, you through some sort of amazing effort, fulfill a 1,000% increase in orders, right? Do, what faith do you have in UPS and FedEx to you know, also fulfill that end of the bargain, right? And actually deliver in the timeline that you have stated to your customer, right? When, you know, UPS and FedEx are getting that thousand percent increase by every single e-tailer, right? So again, with fulfillment, it's not, you know, again, the networks are, are um, you don't have control over all elements of that story. And so, hey, I wanted those, my grandma wanted those Nikes to show up to me on my birthday, but UPS delivers them like literally eight days later. Um, maybe she charges it, charges it back, right? Maybe she's like, well, they never came. So they must have gotten lost. So I'm going to charge it back, right? So stuff like this happens all the time. And again, that's always been the case. It's just, it used to be like a fraction of a fraction. And now it's, you know, a much larger number. So um, we, we, there are some amazing things uh, that we have seen where we're just like, wow, okay. Like this is the new world. So, so we've got, um, we've got, 
a couple questions from the audience coming in. I'll, I'll, I might kind of combine uh, two of these into one. And, and these, the, the first group here is for, uh, for Adrian. Um, can you talk through the connections that you have with the largest suppliers out there, Chase, First, first Data, WorldPay, et cetera? And then additionally, with the increase in the number of pay or payment facilitators, Payfax, um, and the expansion of the different types of payment products available, does that yeah. change what you guys have to do? Obviously, it's you know the payment side of this, that's the other side of the PayPal side. We're seeing an, an explosion on you know, yeah. APM. How do you guys deal with that? So the first question, like in terms of what, what we connect in into and how, um, a bit of that is listed on our website. Um, there are some connections that we, we can't necessarily list on our website for a bunch of different reasons, but um, the short answer is that um, what we have done at ChargeHound is figured out how to abstract, sorry, let me back up a little bit. Every single payment processor handles disputes completely differently. Why that is, I don't know. Um, like you have to go back 25 years in time and sort of figure it out. But um, again, it's a gray area. So everything around chargebacks is kind of open to interpretation and it's sort of purposefully opaque for a number of reasons. Um, and so every payment processor sort of parses that information differently. What we have done is tried to streamline and abstract that in a way that one makes sense to the merchant and two is a bit more transparent, frankly, than how a lot of the industry treats it. So like a lot of the, what happens in the chargeback world is, um, hey, you got to win. Okay, so you won that chargeback. What they don't tell you is that, well, the customer can, can um, basically re-dispute um, uh, re that chargeback even after you've won the first chargeback. And it goes to this thing called the arbitration process where um, you get notified of this thing called a pre-arb. Some payment processors don't even tell you about that process and they will just auto loss you if it comes back as a pre-arb. And you will never know that it went into sec what's called the second disputed part of the cycle. So when we talk about companies like Chase, First Data and WorldPay, they are, you know, to be, you know, candid, right? They're built on sort of legacy ways of thinking about this. And, and that has some utility to it. Um, but it, it can also be confusing if you're a merchant that's new to all of this. Uh, so for us, we treat our integrations to companies like, or to payment processors like that in a much more case by case basis. Um, so the short answer to your question is, is yeah, like, you know, reach out and talk to us. The longer answer is, is it as easy not to be a shameless plug, but like, is it as easy as connecting to Braintree? No, right. Braintree, it's literally, you click a button and you're done. So shout outs to the Braintree team. Um, but, but yeah, it is, it is, it is a bit different. Um, but we, you know, like I said, we kind of handle those on a case by case basis, but we, we have serviced a wide variety of customers in the past. Um, and then do currently. And then the, what was the other part of the question? Uh, the payback bit. Yeah, payfax and the different types of payment products available. Yeah, and it yeah. Has, has that changed the way you uh, handle disputes? So the funny thing about disputes is that the dispute setup does not care at all about technology. <laughs> like, um, you know, the, the dispute ordinance, the, the card network guidance, all of that, is relatively indifferent to what new payment products are out there. And so what you get um, is a lot of newer companies and newer technologies coming out, having to figure out the best way to abstract that, that sort of old school chargeback flow in a way that is, makes sense. Um, and so there's a, there's a number of companies that have done this. Again, you know, I'll just use Braintree because um, you know, we're on the, the PayPal Braintree call mm -hmm. or whatever, but you know, they, they, they built a disputes API and they've worked to really sort of help ensure that a lot of the flow is very clearly communicated to the merchant, even though there's a ton of work they do on the backside dealing with the acquirers and crap like that. So when you talk about Payfax and new payment products, if they're accepting credit cards, um, chargebacks still exist. They still exist on Apple Pay. They still exist on Google Pay. You know, they exist, you know, where credit cards are, just remember, even Apple Card is built on top of a bank, right? It's still a MasterCard at the end of the day. And so they still have to play by those rules. Um, and just to confirm, because there's, there's one quick follow up here on Apple Pay, is, is there any difference given the, the biometrics associated with that? Or is that... Um, you can always charge it back. 
here's what I'll tell you. Go and find an iOS developer and ask me if they've, if they've ever won a chargeback. Um, you know, so I think one of the things is that chargebacks, again, are a gray area. Apple doesn't own the card networks. Not yet, anyways. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> um, and so there's going to be that power struggle, right? Visa, Mastercard, Amex, right? These are large entities. Pay, you know, PayPal. Um, you know, Apple still has to play ball. And so, you know, if they want it to be a credit card and it's going to be a credit card transaction, there's still a gateway for chargebacks. And yes, even a biometric, like. The, the disputes that we have seen come through as a loss where we literally have seen things like here's a photo of this person, you know, uh, with this product and it still comes back as a loss, you know, things like that happen because that's, again, it's, it's a fundamentally very human process still compared to everything else in, in the uh, payment space. So Kevin, we, we talked earlier around, uh, or at least alluded to this notion of disrupting the business model of fraud. Uh, this is something you guys have talked a lot about. Can you um, can you kind of uh, elaborate on that just a little bit more? Yeah, I can give a, a bit of an example. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, criminals are in this to make money. So maybe one attack chain they're trying to build is breaking into a merchant customer's account that has stored payment details. Maybe it's got a stored credit card and then they buy something for $300 and ship it to an address that maybe it's a house for sale. So no one is at the house and they live nearby and they'll go pick up the item from this house that's for sale. So that's kind of the attack technique. They can remain relatively anonymous through that process because they're not giving up their real street address. They're not giving up their real credit card, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so that's, that's kind of maybe what they're doing. They're trying to extract money out, right? For the merchant, they need to figure out how do we make it uh, more difficult or more expensive or more onerous for them to ultimately succeed in doing this because it all is driven by the return on investment for the bad guy. If it costs them 100 times as much to do the same kind of attack, they're probably not going to do it at the end of the day. So you need to kind of break down this attack into a number of different factors. So if the attack is originating with an account takeover style attack to get into a merchant customer's account, then they're probably going to use credential stuffing to break into the account. So they're getting access to the data breached lists, username, passwords, 30% of the internet uses the same passwords. Um, the most common credential stuffing lists, uh, they use things like the entire uh, word space of all of Wikipedia. So if your password is anything that's a real word, you're going to be broken into straight away. So they're going to do this. Um, you know, the economics that go into deciding how much money am I going to break into uh, also is a factor. So if you're a merchant that has, you know, a million customers, they don't necessarily know who your million customers are. So they need to first figure out, okay, I need to test a billion usernames to even find the valid million customers that you've got. And then I need to test passwords against those million accounts to figure out who are valid. I need to probably purchase things like IP proxies if you're doing things like rate limiting. So that's an example of something you can do to prevent them from being successful is implement technology that increases the cost of testing multiple passwords. Uh, obviously, Arcos does this very well, but there are other techniques, you know, things like multi-factor, of course, drive up the cost of attacks. Uh, obviously, it has friction for good customers and most users won't enable it, but that's an example of a kind of friction to bad actors. So if you can increase the cost to even break into accounts, then that's one factor. The other factor is solutions, you know, like ChargeHound. If you're making it more expensive for them to make uh, transactions after they break into accounts, then you're also increasing their cost. Really, you need to think about it from the lens of how are they originating the attack and how are they exiting the attack and how through that journey can we increase cost and increase friction for the bad actor. That's also not going to increase cost for good customers getting through as well. Um, but that's kind of typically how we look at it. And every fraudulent attack has some kind of return on investment math being done for them to decide to make the attack or not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that was the the fundamental shift in, in thinking through the business is that you're not ever fully going to be able to stop everything. You've got, you've got to just make it not worth your while. Um, so, you need, uh, you need good customers to come in. And if you're allowing good customers, bad guys can slip in if they look good enough. Right. So that's kind of the, uh, the big Achilles heel. There's no impervious to being uh, attacked. It's just simply, can you be not worthwhile? And if you can be not worthwhile, then, then you suddenly have a, a much different problem uh, versus yeah. if uh, money is raining from your store. Um, 
just a, a quick reminder for everyone, there's about uh, 10 minutes left here uh, of the webinar, but um, if you have any open uh, or unanswered questions or something that's kind of piqued your interest through this conversation, uh, please uh, put it in the Q&A and we will uh, try and get to it before we wrap up today. Um, so as we're, as we're approaching the end, um, we'd be curious for your guys' thoughts of the role of automation technology in, in kind of this payments and fraud space changing over the next decade? Like what are some of the new technologies and concepts you guys might be thinking through? Um, and you know, how do you, how do you view this problem, you know, for merchants again, evolving over the next decade as well? So maybe Adrian, I'll, I'll throw it to you first. Yeah. I mean, I think we're obviously big believers in automation. Um, again, I, I think that, this, this paradigm shift around the scale of, of how companies um, should be thinking about their business is here. And um, you're starting to see sort of winners and losers emerge. And it's basically how, who are the most operationally efficient merchants because operational efficiency drives margin, right? And it's sort of implementing technologies that, that sort of streamline your process, free you up, to think about and solve problems in, in new and creative ways. So it's kind of to Kevin's point, right? Like if you are just being inundated with attacks, right? Um, and all you're doing is trying to fight it the same old way, it's expensive and it's, it's a lag on your brain, right? It's on your team's uh, your sort of ability to execute, it's expensive. And then when you look at something like Arcos, it's a creative way, right, of drastically reducing the amount of resources you need to deal with what is already an intensive process, both for the fraudster and for the merchant, right? So now that that shift has happened where it's not as expensive or difficult for the merchant if they're using Arcos, but, you know, the fraudster still is still using the same amount of force, right? Um, and so you're going to see that permeate the entire payment stack, um, and you're already seeing that. Um, there is so much drive, right, in PayPal too, right? How do we reduce the friction for payments globally? How do we make it so that you can buy anything anywhere, regardless of what currency you're in, right? PayPal is a reducing, uh, reduces friction there. All of that is automation, right? Um, and so when we think about for ChargeHound, what we're looking at is, hey, is there a way to uh, get out ahead of the chargeback problem? Um, so we're working on some things there. Is there a way to take the data that we have, which is now probably the largest, you know, third party data set around friendly fraud confirmation on the planet? Um, how do we make that useful for companies like Arcos Labs, right? And companies where we can, you know, sort of feed into the rest of the network. But I agree that it's going to be a collaborative effort. And it's something that I'm a big fan of is with PayPal's approach is no one company is going to ever be able to come to a merchant and silver bullet every single possible part of the problem of payments. And it's just not going to happen. And if you have a platform that makes sort of collaboration easier, you're definitely going to um, emerge ahead of sort of more antagonistic companies. Um, and that, that just like constantly want control. I think when we're talking to future, um, one big trend we see is all, and we had a question earlier about it, is privacy. So privacy has become uh, more and more important online. There's regulations, there's laws, all kinds of things. Um, privacy is also a big problem for solutions that are trying to combat fraudsters because the harder it is to figure out who is doing things, the harder it is to make the decision on are you good or bad. Um, good users are looking more like bad users and bad users have always done their best to look as close as they can to good users. Um, so the advancements in browsers, anti-tampering, anti-fingerprinting, all of these kind of techniques that are coming into play are actually going to, I think, uh, push the ball back in the favor of the bad guys because they're able to hide their identity more and good guys are also going to be hiding their identity as well. So the traffic itself is actually going to get harder and harder over the coming years to delineate uh, good and bad, and that's gonna have a rise in fraud because that's the kind of signals we use to mitigate fraud. Um, yeah. So I, unfortunately, I think it's gonna get worse before it gets better on some of these things. That's, it's interesting around security. It's one thing I didn't touch on is, so a lot of the traditional ways that you deal with disputes at scale is you offshore the team, right? Um, and so you've got like 100 people somewhere like Barbados or the Philippines. Well, GDPR, 
right? Makes that an extremely exposed and risky setup. Even if you have a hundred people like in Las Vegas or something, right? It's a huge problem now because are all of those people, are you logging the activity of all those people? Can you confirm that all the caches get wiped every single day, like with right to be forgotten? So um, again, automation sort of changes that. It's like, well, no, it's all computers and it's all logged and it's immediately purged when you do a sort of, um, you know, right to be forgotten request. But that, you know, that has really forced merchants to think about it because the number of right to be forgotten requests are going to skyrocket as more transactions happen online. And, for sure. and that's the kind of a similar trend that uh, a similar approach we take is instead of just relying on the data, like pretty much all the legacy solutions in the uh, fraud industry that are just kind of data driven, yeah. um, we interdict with technology, which lets us figure out, you know, biometric scores and things like that, that they can't fake. And they're going to have more unique profiles because of it. So we need to figure out methods that aren't reliant on things that are actually going to start going away because of uh, GDPR and privacy. Awesome. Yeah, I think somebody had asked on, on the on the Q and A around data changing as automation uh, increases, but uh, I think you guys kind of just addressed that, especially with GDPR and, and things like that. Um, you know, an interesting question here. I'd, I'd be curious. Um, how is Arcos preparing? For the potential rise in fraud attempts uh, on accounts, given that this is an election year, I think this is just a super topical thing uh, with all, going, all that's going on. Yeah. So um, election or fake news or however you want to coin the term, uh, it really is the concept of someone has a message and they want to amplify it. So whether it's a true or false statement, if they can get enough people to make that message be liked or retweeted or all these kind of things it starts to have a sentiment of legitimacy about it, right? So the way that they're doing these kind of attacks is there's really two prongs. First is their mass creating accounts that they then use to upvote, like retweet, et cetera, content. The other is they break into legitimate profiles and use those to do the same thing. But this is still, again, uh, an, a, a criminal ecosystem. This isn't, you know, one country just going and directly attacking a big social media network. They're actually purchasing from businesses that have already pre-collected the accounts, pre-created accounts, populated them with account data that looks legitimate enough. Um, so the way that you solve these kind of problems, again, is all economics. If you can make the middleman's business not functional, go out of business, they can't procure accounts, they can't break into accounts, the ROI doesn't work for them, they can't resell things like post uh, an article and then we'll retweet it a million times to get legitimate sentiment. Uh, you can actually break and stop these kind of problems by using the same techniques. If you can make the entire kill, you know, the entire chain of events that they're using to build that uh, attack uneconomical, then you can solve that problem. Um, so election interference and a content in general, you know, we work with a lot of companies on stopping bad content and stopping trolls and things like that. They're not necessarily fraudsters. We, we consider this more abuse than fraud. That's why we call ourselves a fraud and abuse platform. Uh, really, you can also deter abusive behavior with the same techniques uh, that we use to deter fraudsters. Um, but it's definitely going to be uh, interesting. And, you know, we're working with a number of social media companies to do just so. Awesome. Um, well, I think that's probably a good place to stop. I know we had uh, one question that we're, we're probably not going to get a chance to get to, uh, but we will uh, try and answer that offline. But I uh, appreciate everybody uh, joining us today. Um, really uh, enjoyed the conversation. Thought uh, Kevin and Adrian, you, you, you guys did a great job uh, with giving your perspectives on all of this. Um, you know, feel free to to reach out to us, um, any of us, on any kind of follow ups here, and um, hope everyone has a great rest of their week. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Jay. Thanks for everybody for organizing this.